Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to uh, thank you for participating in this conversation with Jeremy Lent on the need for deep transformation. I'm Rob West, the Acquisitions Editor at New Society Publishers. Uh, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm broadcasting from my home on the unceded territory of the Sinema First Nation. I'd like to honor the traditional stewards of the land that I inhabit. Uh, New Society Publishers has a mission to publish books for a world of change and to provide the world with fundamental tools to help build a just and ecologically sustainable society. Um, this year we're celebrating our 40th anniversary. Um, you can find us at newsociety.com, learn more about our books, um, including Jeremy's book, which we'll talk a bit about today, um, access our blog content and subscribe to our newsletter, and learn about forthcoming books. Um, you can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and if you're watching us on Facebook, Rob, you just went mute on us. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, I somehow was muted. Um, and I, uh, give us a like, and if you're recording, uh, a recording of this conversation will be posted on our YouTube channel afterward. Um, we're also offering for all the viewers a discount on books right now. Sorry, I think the host keeps muting me accidentally. <laughs> um, I just unmuted myself again. Um, we have a discount code, uh, radical25 is the discount code. You can use this until December 25th, or December 12th, sorry, for books off of our website, newsociety.com. Um, as, as the conversation unfolds, please post your questions in the Facebook feed, and towards the end of the conversation with Jeremy, we'll ask him to field those questions. Um, this event is part of Radical December, which is um, uh, December to Transform the World. It's a month of Radical Talks, which is a joint project of the Radical Publishers Alliance, a collective of about two dozen publishers across the world working towards justice and system change in cooperation with Literal uh, Festival, a Radical Festival of Books and Ideas held annually in Barcelona. You can find out more about the events at RadicalPublishersAlliance.com and literalbcn.com, L-E-T-E-R-A-L-B-C-N.com. Um, I'd now like to introduce our speaker. Um, it's with the utmost pleasure that I introduce Jeremy Lent. Uh, Jeremy's based in Berkeley, California. Tell you a bit about him before we chat. Um, Jeremy is uh, an author whose writings investigate the patterns of thought that have led to civiliz led civilization to its current existential crisis. Uh, his 2017 book, The Patterning Instinct, A Cultural History of Humanity's Search for Meaning, explores the ways humans have made meaning from the cosmos from hunter-gatherer times to the present day. The book was described by George Monbiot of The Guardian, and this just blew my mind. It's actually why I bought the book before I even knew Jeremy. Uh, George Monbiot said, it's the most profound, brilliant, and potentially world-changing book I've read this century. Um, Jeremy's upcoming book, The Web of Meaning, Integrating Science and Traditional Wisdom to Find Our Place in the Universe, will be published in June of 2021 by New Society uh, in the, the Canada and the US, and by Profile um, Books in the UK. And it will be available worldwide uh, through one of us. Um, Jeremy writes topical articles exploring the deeper patterns of political and cultural developments, and you can find out more about him and the Web of Meaning uh, at his website, jeremylent.com. He's got links to other projects that he works on there as well. Uh, so finally, good morning, Jeremy. Um, thank you for joining us in this conversation about the need for deep transformation. Um, and before we get started, I just wanted to set the stage quickly here of why we might need to talk about deep transformation. So we've got global heating, climate change happening. Um, when the Industrial Revolution started in 1750, greenhouse gas or CO2 emissions were at about 280 parts per million. Fast forward to 1980, um, and I'll tell you why later that's important. Um, it was about 335 parts per million. When the Paris Agreement took effect in November 2016, 
GHG or CO2 concentrations were at 400 parts per million. And as of last month in November, they were at 413 parts per million. And our annual GHG emissions worldwide have now topped 35 billion tons per year. Um, the IPCC says we have about eight years to reduce our carbon emissions by half um, and to zero by 2050, or we're going to face a hothouse Earth scenario. Compounding that, the 2019 IPBES Global Assessment Report on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, the biggest comprehensive, most comprehensive biodiversity assessment in human history, has indicated that about a million species are at risk of extinction. And the UN shows that since 1990, some 71% of countries have seen an increase in economic inequality. In 2018, the richest 26 people owned as much as the bottom 40% of people on the planet, which is some 3.8 billion people. And we've seen, uh, with the Black, Black Lives Matter uh, protests started in the States and have been spreading uh, across the West, certainly, that um, we're seeing the exposure of the racism, the systemic racism that's embedded in America and indeed much of the West and has been there for centuries. And finally, compounding that is the COVID pandemic. So I could go on and on and on with a laundry list of, of crises. So the first thing I wanna ask you, Jeremy, is, um, given what I just said and your reading and knowledge, um, what is this um, crisis that we're facing? Are we in fact facing a, facing a crisis, not just of these, these uh, individual um, things, but rather a crisis of civilization itself? Yes, well, you, you've certainly taken us through the litany of some of the major um, areas where things feel like they're, they're falling apart. And, you know, there, there are a lot of, people like um, I think probably Steven Pinker is probably the most famous of them, but there's no end of people who look at all these things and say, yes, but you know, we as humans, we're hardwired to just look at the worst things um, and you know, we'll take things out of proportion. If you look at the big picture, you'll see that actually there's this kind of uh, progress in the quality, even um, like the even progress in things like um, global poverty uh, reduction, all this kind of stuff, and that this is being overblown. Um, and I, I think it's it's really good to just keep that overall perspective, and then to realize basically how wrong uh, the, those those are those people are who are trying to claim that we are looking at overall progress because. What is going on is that these, the various ways in which our society has been structured are being pulled and pulled and pulled towards breaking points. Um, and what we're seeing is a fundamental unsustainability in the way things are, have, have been uh, sort of rolled out. So even those who claim that things are improving are a little bit like say, um, if, if someone's inherited um, some inheritance from a wealthy uncle and they keep spending it faster and faster and faster and, and the, their accountants keep saying, you know, you can't keep this up because you're going to hit bankruptcy soon. So he fires those people and then finds ways to spend it even more quickly and says, I'm doing so great. Look, every year I'm, I'm making more money than before, but that is fundamentally unsustainable. And suddenly you hit a crash. And what's terrifying, it takes a lot longer to, re to hit that point on the whole global earth system but what is terrifying is all those statistics you're showing are that we are take coming towards breaking points so much so that even if we were to actually somehow through some sort of magic bullet kind of fix the climate crisis and move things towards um some a reduction in emissions uh in in the in the reasonable time frame if we keep growing our society in the same way if we keep if our system maintains this consumption, growth, and uh, growth and production and um, destruction of the earth as a resource, we are going to just keep moving towards that precipice. So I do feel we are we have a deep, uh, deep crisis, not just within the particulars of climate or the particulars of pollution or this or that, but in the whole way in which our societal structure works. Well, that's what I was gonna ask you about. So um, 
I mean, is this a, a crisis that runs somehow deep at the level of how we think about our place in the world or, our, or what makes us a civilization or a people? I mean, how is it that some people can blindly go to work and Bay Street or, or the city of London or um, Wall Street and, and see everything through rose-colored glasses? I mean, we seem to have that ability and there's a good chunk of the population that that sees things that way. How do we maintain this positive? Some people maintain this positive um, outlook, um, and others don't. And and is there a, a fundamental rupture happening at the very basic level of how we understand our place and our civilization? Yes. Well, you know, uh, a lot of the work I've done, as you were mentioning, is is to look at the ways in which people make meaning out of their lives. Um, and what we see when we look at that, and a lot of cognitive science um, goes into understanding these, um, these ways in which it happens, is that we tend to, as, as we sort of grow up in whatever society we are born into, we tend to make sense based on what our society tells us are the norms, which means that uh, if, if our society tells us that it's normal, to just consume and that what, what is valuable in life is to um, sort of get wealthy and to have status that way and all these kind of things. A lot of people take that as a given, but there are these deeper human layers of looking for meaning, looking for deep connection that our society has not, um, has actually kind of papered over um, and has kind of shifted out of what is, what the norms are meant to be. And so I think that's what leads to both, on the one hand, people living their lives um, and just shutting out what doesn't fit into the meaning making that our culture tells us. And at the same time, feeling a sense of deep dissatisfaction, a deep sense of alienation, um, and a sense that something is going wrong. But because our society doesn't offer a framework to make meaning out of that, at least this big sort of cognitive dissonance that a lot of people are suffering from right now, which is probably one of the reasons why we are having such extreme political polarities and almost this mass delusion that's going on, particularly in the country I live in, the United States. That's actually quite interesting. We can come back, I'd like to come back to that in a little bit. Before we, we and specifically by that, I, I mean, um, talking about there's no me outlet for making meaning about that as I guess Joanna Macy would call it, dis-ease that we feel. And there's a lot of people that feel that. Before we get to that though, I mean, part of the title of this talk is how um, incrementalism isn't going to solve our problem. So if we are in fact in uh, an existential crisis, I think the science tells us that, we could talk about what the science means in a little bit. Um, why won't incrementalism get there? And, and the reason I ask this is, I'm not quite sure what you mean by incrementalism. So we have on the table right now, um, many countries kicking around the idea of some sort of Green New Deal, um, some sort of, um, especially in the COVID context, um, significant uh, uh, capital being deployed towards some sort of recovery, quote unquote recovery. Mm -hmm. Um, that is oriented towards a, a green recovery. Um, and the idea, I guess, behind this is some sort of renewable powered future as business as usual. usual. We swap our Dodge caravans for, um, for Teslas or something like that. Is that systems change or is that incrementalism? Um, yeah, well, that is more incrementalism in my way of looking at it. It's good incrementalism. <clears throat> I'm not trying to say that it's a waste of time or energy to <clears throat> try to shift things incrementally into a positive direction. Um, and something like the, the Green New Deal, as has been <clears throat> uh, put out there in the United States, um, is, a, is a, you know, a fantastic vision. I totally support it. And I uh, would love to see the new uh, Biden administration get behind something like that. Um, so all these are positive, and I don't want to give some sense to say like, oh, don't waste your time on that. But <clears throat> we have to look at the overall context in which these things are taking place. And even the Green New Deal, for the most part, is presented as being something that, oh, it's good for the economy, um, you know, by shifting 
to renewables from fossil fuels will continue to grow um, GDP uh, by, you know, through this reinvestment. Um, and while that makes sense as a way of sort of promoting it within the context of the sort of mainstream paradigm, the mainstream way of thinking, that approach simply doubles down on this ultimate preconception that we that growth in the economy is a good thing that um somehow uh and, and it's like an, a, an addiction that our global society has which is that if um, a politician's success is measured by you know did uh, that country grow by three percent or more in the past year versus not um, and if you didn't then that's kind of some sort of failure and our whole system is built on that way and everything uh, around that is like self-reinforcing. The way the stock market works is based on the earnings expected by companies, not just next year, but over uh, 10 or even 20 or 30 years into the future. So, and the whole value that people gain from investing and uh, the, the way the global system works is based on this preconception of growth, which would be great if we were in uh, the planet as it was 150 years ago or so, when it was virtually a, a virgin planet. And it, th there was a lot of leeway to be able to turn natural materials into resources for human consumption. But right now we've hit breaking points. And it's as if, so to take another analogy, it's as if we're um, sort of living in a forest where we rely on the trees for everything. Um, and we keep sort of trying to find great machinery to cut down more and more trees even while the last ones are still standing, we'll sort of keep growing until they're all gone. We can't carry on that way. But this is the elephant in the room um, that most mainstream politicians are totally unwilling to look at. And yet when we have any kind of realistic scientific analysis of what we're doing with the earth, we are basically consuming it at a rapidly unsustainable rate and an, an accelerating unsustainable rate. Um, plus we're also, uh, turning human life, the quality of human life, into material for consumption to kind of feed this growth engine. That's what I think needs to change. And by turning human life into that, you mean what? That somebody's being, the system requires exploitation of somebody somewhere. Is that what you mean by that? Right. So our society really is built on sort of monetizing um, <clears throat> everything that is not already part of the monetary economy. So in fact, you can even view GDP as the rate at which um, things that are not part of the monetized economy get pulled into it. So it's pretty clear when we talk about natural resources, if you've got a, a, a beautiful, diverse tropical forest, that's not necessarily giving you much in GDP. If you like cut it all down, um, and grow soy crops to feed the cattle, to um, feed beef consumption. Um, that's great for GDP. It's also destroying the earth. Right. But it's the same with, with human beings. So if human beings um, live in communities together and actually look out for each other and they grow their vegetables um, in gardens or in shared plots and they share what they have with each other, that does nothing for GDP. But if you basically um, force people to actually take whatever they're working and put it into the market, or you force people to work so hard they can't even look after their kids, so then they have to, um, you know, find to pay somebody to look after their kids while they're working the whole time, and they and where they work. Um, it's impossible to even think about cycling there to work or walking to work. So they have to um, buy a car to drive to work. So they have to then, so everything gets monetized, including even our free time. So now because of the way in which the internet has become another vehicle for this kind of um, consumer, uh, uh, almost like this kind of monster, if you will, that like finds its way into everything. Um, now even our free time is monetized. So every time we look at a screen for a moment, um, that attention is, uh, is digitally identified and leads to profits for Facebook or Google or whoever it might be at the expense of our sense of reality. Um, because, and and the, at the expense of even our sense of well-being, because these uh, apps and uh, all the, uh, this various um, modes of internet connection have now been designed to keep us dissatisfied, to keep us on edge, and then to give us like rats on a wheel, little um, and shots of 
tiny micro dopamine shots every time we see a, a like or a, um, yeah, a friend responding to something we wrote or whatever it might be. So we ourselves, our very beings, our souls, have been dragged into this monetized economy. Right. So when I think about that, I, I think, is that the way it had to be? I mean, sometimes, you know, I think about Margaret Thatcher. I know people are out there, probably their eyes are bugging out of their heads right now. Um, and I think about Margaret Thatcher and Tina, um, the famous slogan. That's the reason I mentioned the 1980, 300 parts per million. You know, Margaret Thatcher's famous slogan, there is no alternative. And by that, she was referring, you know, to the West, the system of the West, to neoliberalism um, and capitalism as an economic structure. And sometimes I think she's right. You know, we blanketed everything so heavily under this ideology or this worldview and this economic system that to even conceive of a different way of doing things is beyond comprehension in a lot of cases. So maybe she was right, actually. Maybe... Maybe Fukuyama was right with the end of history claim. Um, maybe it was inevitable. Tell me about that. What is yeah. where we are? I mean, how did we get to this almost singular um, global ideology or worldview? How did we get here? Um, and we can talk about how we can get out of here later. How did we get to this point? That, that is a, uh, a great question. And, um, I, and as, a, as a result of that, of everything you're describing, there's this other quote from Slavov Zizek, which I love, which is um, that it's easier to envisage, for many people, it's easier to envisage the end of the world than the end of capitalism. So it's as though, um, because we are so inculcated with these ideas from when we're infants onwards, and everything in the media takes this as a given, we can't even realize that there is something different. It's a little bit like fish swimming in water. Um, and as humans, we might look at the fish in the water, we recognize, oh, they're in water. But for the fish is born in that, it, it, wouldn't, it has no concept that there's anything other than water to be in. So <clears throat> I think that there's kind of multiple layers of how, how we got there. But I think um, the, to look in recent times, this current way of thinking has really only been a function of a ideas about consumerism and capitalism that got seeded um, in the 19th century, really, um, and then got uh, really transformed into this incredibly powerful insidious model um, through the rise of consumer marketing in the early 20th century, um, where it, you have um, people like Edward Bernays, who is actually the um, nephew of, S of Sigmund Freud, first discovering this notion of the human unconscious and coming up with these new powerful um, ways of um, using marketing messages to get below the conscious level of people, to make them feel the need to consume and consume more. So there was a concerted effort by industrialists and politicians in the early 20th century in the United States to create a consumer culture, which led to a lot of the 20th century being this and um, sort of either or and um, dual uh, sort of oppositional place between unfettered capitalism and communism, which is because, as we know, that that was, you know, the great struggles of the 20th century were often around that. Then communism uh, collapsed under its own um, real uh, serious, serious problems of how it was construed in the first place, uh, which l led to Thatcher saying, oh, now there is no alternative, there's just capitalism. But here's what I find so empowering and so exciting, is when we actually look at capitalism or communism in the 20th century, underlying um, both of those, they actually had some shared um, ontological foundations. They both systems believed, for example, that humans are separate from nature, that nature is a resource to be exploited. Both systems believed in economic growth as being the thing that you're meant to be like targeting. The only things they disagreed in is how you, how you should grow the economy and then how you should distribute it once you've destroyed nature and once you've sort of um, pulled every human being into your sort of um, your material economy. But there, so in a way, the new ways of looking at things 
critique both of those, that old dialectic uh, between communism and capitalism, critique them both in a similar way. Because the new way of looking at things is to look um, at humans' place on the earth as part of the overall expression, manifestation of life as it's evolved over billions of years. And to recognize that the way life has been so, success, so successful on this earth is through this notion of symbiosis, through this notion of different elements of life interacting with other elements, species interacting with other species in ways that is for the benefit of both. And that's where how ecologies have evolved, where they can be incredibly sustainable for millions of years without a problem. So the new way of looking at things, it asks how can we actually re-envision and remodel our human society so that's actually life affirming based on the principles of life and affirming the basic qualities that make humans actually flourish and happy um, and that allow the living earth to flourish with humans rather than humans being um, separate from it and treating it as a place for exploitation. So a fundamentally different way of looking at things than that old split that everyone's got, virtually everyone got stuck in in the 20th century. Right. So I mean, but what does the science tell us about that? Some people would argue that um, we are where we are because humans are inherently selfish, inherently competitive, that that's the overriding um, values that have gotten us here. And they would point to Charles Darwin. They would point to, in fact, the success of um, capitalism and neoliberalism to demonstrate I mean, you're talking about symbiosis. I mean, that is, I don't think that word has been uttered on Wall Street. Um, uh, and so, I mean, tell me about that. How do you square that with, with what some people would say the science has been telling us for 140 years or so? Yeah, yeah, well, thanks for that. Because in a way, what you're doing is looking at a deeper layer than what I just described. I was talking about sort of the rise of consumerism in the 20th century. But what you're pointing to is a deeper ideology of how to understand humans and uh, uh, really how to understand the universe that really we got from uh, the first ways of making sense of things in the scientific revolution of the 17th century. So we can look to people like Darwin in the 19th century, but really we have to go even further back to people like Hobbes um, and Descartes in the 17th century um, for the worldview that, as again, like fish swimming in water, but most of us take for granted without even realizing that it's actually a specific lens of looking at things. So from those people's way of thinking, um, there was a sense of humans being fundamentally separate from the natural world. Humans have like uh, the soul or Descartes translated that into mind, which became our way of thinking about humans since then. Um, and that makes us kind of special and different from the rest of nature. And so it's okay to view nature as really just this kind of um, machine. Um, and then there's this sense of, uh, it's kind of a misinterpretation of Darwin, but one that, um, say Richard Dawkins has been the most powerful uh, propagator of these ideas in recent decades, um, to look at evolution from this point of selfishness, as you pointed out, and actually there's not just humans are selfish, but all of life is selfish, that we actually are, are comprised of selfish genes. Um, and in his words, uh, these genes live in this incredibly competitive, uh, world like sort of Chicago gangsters. So what you need to expect from genes is ruthless selfishness. Um, and so it's not surprising that humans are like that. And so even if you don't buy into the neoliberal market economy and believe that that's how it should be, like a, a Richard Dawkins type might say, well, we need to overcome our selfish genes and impose um, on ourselves uh, greater values that we can as human beings. Well, what's so interesting is that now decades of findings in modern science have shown these to be fundamentally wrong, in fact. Well, for starters, the gene itself is not actually this kind of single unit of evolution. Actually, the gene interacts with its organism, and there's much more of a complex dynamic um, that arises even through gene expression and how evolution takes place. But what's even more fascinating is if you look actually at evolution, um, over billions of years, the major stages of evolution that has brought us to this beautiful, rich world we live in have all been the result of different 
elements in nature and di different species finding ways to cooperate at deeper layers, allowing for this incredible complexity um, that we live in today. So the whole recognition, the whole diversity of the natural world arises because of different um, species have been specialists in one particular thing, finding ways to work with other specialists so that they can create something of benefit for both parties, which then evolves into this incredible rich ecosystems we have. So not only have these ideas been very dangerous, but they have been shown by modern science to be actually wrong. We can really celebrate um, the evolu evolutions being a result of cooperation. And what's so fascinating is that humans, what makes humans really unique, certainly among other primates, is that we developed um, some millions of years ago, as we sort of branched off from other primates, um, actually a whole deeper, sophisticated layers of being able to cooperate with each other that leads us to actually have emotions um, that relates to what are called moral emotions. We feel um, a sense of morality. We feel a sense of fairness. We want to be respected by others. We want to be seen as being generous and caring, not because we're being selfish manipulators, but because we actually evolved for those feelings, those emotions to be part of our group identity, which was part of the success of Homo sapiens. So it's almost like these fundamental stories that people believe are right um, have been inverted by the findings of modern science in recent decades, not just by a few scientists, but by massive amounts of peer reviewed science. Um, so that we need to, these need to inculcate now into our culture. We need to reimagine what the world could look like based on true findings of science. Right, so, so in effect, the, the, I mean, whether it's the, the, the communist economy during the Cold War or the capitalist neoliberal economy then and what we have now in, in, in hyperdrive is derived from a certain understanding of how humans are separate from nature in a, in a specific way of, of viewing science that sees competition as the overriding dynamic within our genes and between species. And what you seem to be suggesting is that a lot of the science has now turned that on its head and has said, okay, there, there's probably competitiveness out there, but cooperation is actually the, the, the thread or symbiosis and cooperation is the thread that runs through evolution. Um, and the science is now discovering that uh, in spades everywhere. My question is how, how does that, how does that filter through in society? I mean, this juggernaut, this, this sort of neoliberal juggernaut has been rolling, you know, in full force for 40 or 50 years, but really it's, it's, it's been rolling for 200 years in one form or another. Um, and that mythology or the story of competition is replicated continuously. Um, and on a popular level, I think some of the science you're talking about, I don't know how you would characterize it, system science, ecological mm -hmm. science, ca ca right. I mean, some of it probably comes from chaos, um, complexity science. Right. How does that filter down to the everyday level or to the level eventually of, of politics and, and how we think about the world as individuals? Do you have any idea of how we, I mean, we could come to more to how we get there, but I'm curious about how a worldview shifts um, so right. Yeah, well, I think um, there's a, a couple of ways to come at what you're asking. The, the, the first is, just from a, a simple uh, perspective, the first thing we need to do is name it. You know, until we actually look at these uh, fundamental things, until we, uh, as a fish, we say to the other fish, there's this medium we're in, it's called water. Right. And we need to recognize that. And, um, you know, maybe there's other mediums out there. Maybe fish can evolve into land animals at some point by sort of exploring what other possibilities are out there. Until we name this thing that we just take for granted, we're stuck in it. Um, and uh, in, in fact, um, to some degree, um, naming it was part of what I uh, tried to do in that earlier book I wrote, The Patterning Instinct, which was looking yes. at the different the way different cultures make meaning 
out of the universe. Um, and partly we can do that when we do that historically. Um, and when, when we do that, looking at even how different scientific perspectives make different meanings out of the universe, we get to see that we don't have to be stuck in the frame in which our uh, culture told us we need to make sense of things from when we were uh, sort of became when we were infants onwards. So that's the, the first thing we need to do. But then to the larger perspective of your question, how does culture change? This is really this key question because um, cultures can be incredibly um, long lived and incredibly powerful in the sort of paradigms that they set. I look at something like Christianity, which um, anybody might look at that from a scientific perspective or, um, or so many different perspectives and say, this is utter nonsense. Um, and yet you know, it's been incredibly powerful for uh, two millennia and, and, and still is. Or we can uh, look at in a, a traditional Chinese thought, which was one the probably the longest lived unbroken culture um, in the world, where from 500 or more BC, to the um, to fairly recently in history, there was this traditional Chinese way of making sense of things, which everyone from one generation to the next took for granted. But now we look at China and we see that culture fundamentally transformed into basically the most powerful at this point growth economy in the world, like beating the West at its own capitalist uh, approaches to exploitation or you name it. So we might ask, that, how did that happen? That's a great paradigm to actually understand. And what we see there is that that traditional way of making sense of things in China um, got un undermined, got unwound when the West came and basically um, humiliated the leadership in China and actually um, kind of ravaged the way that that culture works. So that if starting from the late 19th century onwards, new generations of people in China would grow up saying, we don't accept this crap that we're given. There, there was something wrong about our old world view um, because they saw that it no longer worked. And so they, they tried out obviously one new Western idea of um, communism in, in terms of Maoism, uh, and they tried that for a few decades, that didn't work, so then they kind of shifted uh, to capitalism. That's been working great in the short term for them. Um, but what we learn from that is that uh, a, a, the paradigm, the actual worldview that a culture has that makes sense of things, um, will continue to be stable as long as it's kind of works for the society as a whole. But when something happens, either internal or exogenous factors that undermine that society, then new generations of people no longer take as a given what their parents tell them or what authorities tell them. And they start to look around for different ways of making sense of things. Now, that is what I see as one of the hopeful um, perspectives through which we can look at these things. Because as our, we, we started off talking about how we're hitting this incredible crisis point of our society, and we're talking about the demonstrations on the streets all around the world and in relation to the inequities. Like right now, there's hundreds of thousands of Indian farmers like just planted there, not uh, you know, just standing up saying, we're not going to accept one more step towards this neoliberal um, turning our own livelihood into, uh, into markets. We're going to see more and more of that around the world. And when we see that, when we see people like Greta Thunberg and children around the world saying like, I don't want to grow up in the world that is um, getting destroyed in a world, I, I don't want to grow up in this place of collapse. Uh, we need to change things right now. That's where it's, there's this possibility of people looking around for new ways of meaning making. And that's where it's so important that when people look around for that, they don't just get sort of stuck in some of these old um, and some more destructive critiques like um, sort of neo-fascism or um, you know, people saying, oh yeah, we just need to look after ourselves, put up the borders um, and screw everybody else. We need to offer these new generations new ways of meaning making that actually speak to their souls, to their spirit, and actually can lead to a sense of regenerative future for humanity. Well, I think that's a vital point. We could talk about that a bit more. The, um, before I, I go on, um, if anyone has any questions out there, please do post them in the feed and, and we'll field them in a minute. 
Um, because that risk is always and ever present to misquote Paul Volcker um, about something entirely unrelated. Uh, and that is that you get this rise of, of um, what we're seeing as tribalism in the sense of fascism or authoritarianism. Um, I mean, there were 70 million people that voted for Trump, for example, 70 some million. Um, so there is ever the risk that we retract into um, somewhere worse than we are. Um, so when you're talking about possibilities of looking at new ways of making meaning, um, what is a vision? What is a vision for something that we can transform to that supersedes that conversation I've had a million times over the past decades of, well, if not this, what do you want? Communism? As if there were right. only ever two choices. Um, and the answer to that is no and no, right. <laughs> really. It's something else entirely. Um, and I know in, in the Web of Meaning, there's a, you know, it's substantially about this, which is something you've called an ecological civilization. Can you tell us a bit about this alternative vision? Yes, I'd um, be, be happy to. And um, this is really um, a vision of how we can transform the world that like no end of people are working on in their different ways around the world right now. This is certainly, it's not like um, some sort of um, invented here type of vision. The very concept of an ecological civilization is really like the vision of reimagining if uh, um, a different kind of civilization, one that instead of being built on what is um, wealth affirming or wealth or exploitation as our current civilization, a civilization that is life affirming, that's built actually on the principles of life. And in fact, these very ideas are both kind of new and ancient. Indigenous cultures around the world have always seen um, themselves organizing their own selves and their own lives as being part of a greater living system and, and seeing the sanctity and reverence from Mother Earth as being part of their very um, value system. So in a way, it's a, like modern society rediscovering the great wisdom from the past. Um, and we also see that in, in non-Western um, uh, later cultures, such as East Asian culture, which um, saw the connections between things as being far more important than the things themselves, for example. But um, the, this notion of an ecological civilization is, and, and, and by the way, the term is not mine. I've become very excited by it um, as other people have been uh, developing these ideas. And, and part of what I love about this term ecological civilization is that it recognizes first that the changes that have to be made have to be happening at the deepest layers. We have to I really transform our very civilization itself, but it also gives a sense of a vision of what is actually possible. So you might ask, well, what is an ecological civilization? What would a civilization look like that was based on these kind of life-affirming principles? So if you imagine a civilization actually based on principles of things like symbiosis, um, or um, if you look at an ecology and why it's healthy, it's, it's partly healthy because of diversity and balance and a sense of circularity. Like when energy comes from the sun, every single part of that energy is used by different elements within the ecosystem so that it's actually self-sustainable. There is no waste because basically the waste products of one species is the nutrition for another. So if we imagine our own society on those basis, some of the fundamental things we'd see is first off a shift in this incredible inequality. Um, because um, in an ecosystem, um, no ecosystem stays healthy when one species begins to take over everything else and destroys the other species. That leads to ultimate self-destruction. Um, that only even happens in an ecosystem when something is already out of balance for some, um, you know, for some particular reason. So we'd look at a big shift in, um, uh, in e equality, um, even to something such as a um, full uh, institution of universal basic income, where every person 
uh, in a country or in, throughout the world basically receives enough income to live on to find so, um, decent housing and education and nutrition. So you don't have these incredible um, inequities that you were describing earlier. Another fundamental element about it would be transforming our economy from a growth-based economy to one that was steady state and circular, to one where um, the materials we used were, uh, were um, recyclability and repair and non-waste was built in from the beginning. A shift from these horrendous industrial agricultural um, destruction fields, which are uh, basically turning the world in these kind of monocrop uh, industries, a shift from that to agroecology, which has been shown, by the way, to be as efficient or more efficient in actually producing uh, enough food to feed the world than these kind of industrial crops, all of their horrendous pollution that they cause. So in each of these areas, there are these shifts, even to the deep cultural shifts of uh, recognizing the rights of nature as much as the rights of human beings as being part of what a civilization should be based on. Um, we're talking about fundamental shifts um, and ones that are necessary if we're actually going to find a civilization, uh, find ourselves in a civilization that can truly be sustainable into the future. Okay, so that, um, I mean, I'm nodding my head internally, possibly externally as well, um, to all of those things. Um, and I mean, we're in a, a bit of a bubble, really, the two of us, um, others. We see this as, as something that needs to happen. To many people out there, this is mind-blowing, this sort of stuff. Um, but even to the people who see this as a vision worth pursuing, the fundamental question always comes up, which is you've got engaged citizens, you've got distraught people in the face of ecological destruction, millions of distraught people. Um, and the question then comes up, okay, so what, what actions can I take? I mean. But, you know, and people should start to consider themselves to be activists, not necessarily in the streets at the barricades activists, but the activism is a broad spectrum, a big waterfront with room for everybody. If this is a vision, that compelling vision, an ecological society with fundamentally different um, principles and values, how, what are some tangible things that we can do to get ourselves moving in that direction? in the face of this smothering neoliberal capitalist um, juggernaut. Right, yeah, that's a great um, place to go, Rob. And, um, and of course, it's, it's very easy to look at that juggernaut um, and look at this vision I was just laying out, which seems so far-fetched, so different from the world the way it is now, that you can just dismiss it and just say, well, great ideas, but it'll never happen. So uh, let's just get back to trying to make this little fix right now, because that's all we can basically do. Um, or you can go into that, that place of sort of deep despair, if you will, and say, no, we're heading for destruction. We're not going to be able to stop it. It's inevitable. So we just have to move to, you know, what's been called um, deep adaptation or whatever. Just uh, look out for whatever we can, look out for our spiritual and community well-being, because we can shift directions. Um, and I mean, I tell you, I recognize the ways in which it's very easy to get to those places. All you need to look at is this kind of, uh, just look at where we're headed and just keep plotting that line a little bit yes. further and, and there's no other place than destruction. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the lessons that I've learned looking at deep history um, is the non-linearity of change. The fact that change, mm. when it does happen, it can be incredibly surprising um, and incredibly profound. Uh, and then when you look back on it, then you look at the underpinnings that caused it to happen. So when we're looking at what needs to be done right now in our civilization, um, one of the things that we can recognize is that there's actually deep work already being done to shift some of these foundations in just the way I'm describing all around the world by uh, groups of people who are increasingly getting more traction and more power around them to make these transformations happen. It's a little bit like if you want to go back to that ecosystem metaphor, you know, if you walk around a forest and you see the trees around you, um, what you don't recognize, but scientists have begun to discover is that underground, there's this um, mycorrhizal fungal network, 
which actually connects all the different trees so that one tree can actually supply nutrition through this network to another tree and they can communicate together and do all these things that we didn't even know about before. And this, tr this movement towards transformation and that is happening right now is a little bit like that fungal network. You won't read about it necessarily every day in the newspapers, but these are things that are happening. So what we can do as individuals is kind of um, plug into that. And I think that there's kind of different layers in which we can do that. The first is within ourselves, um, is really just to do our own introspection. Look at areas where our own minds have been colonized by the same exploitative way of thinking and actually um, do our own internal value assessment of what is really meaningful to me. Um, where can I actually get meaning from? How can I live my life in ways that actually, rather than contribute to the destruction of the world, can actually be shifting to contribute to a regenerative world? Um, and that happens at the same time as we kind of really recognize community because change cannot happen through each of us as individuals acting alone. Uh, like those, imagining those trees without that mycorrhizal fungal network. It's when we connect with others in community that we empower them and we empower ourselves and the whole um, movement towards change becomes far more powerful. So that involves looking for those others in our community that are seeing similar things, giving voice to that, but simply voicing some of these bigger issues allows them to then become, rather than sort of too big to even think about and terrifying, to actually be looked at and other solutions to be coming up with. So we can look at um, things like rebuilding community on sort of commons basis, like one of your um, uh, one of the authors in your um, network, David Bollier, um, is this great thinker about the commons and really reimagining how we can connect with each other economically and socially in a fundamentally different way in, in his great book, Free, Fair and Alive, which um, I just read recently is totally inspired by. Um, so there are these different ways of looking at that. And then globally, uh, we can actually uh, really put our energy into putting time into some of the systems change that is needed. It's not enough just to focus on ourselves and our community, but we have to engage with some of these larger global systems. And even if it feels uncomfortable and um, get involved in order to try to make these changes happen. Right, so there's issues there. I mean, I think of, I think it's James Glake in his book Chaos where he's you know describing a, a, a ball bouncing down a, a mountain ridge and you know, at, at any given point, it can keep going down that ridge. So let's let's call that our current trajectory. And then uh, the way you know complexity works is a grain of sand somewhere on that ridge is enough to cause that ball to go one way or the other. And once it falls down one side of the ridge or the other, there's sort of a phase change, so to speak. It can't go back up over the ridge. And so I feel like what you're saying is that there's many points along that that ridge that we're on where um, nonlinear effects can happen. Um, and we don't quite know where it might happen, but we can start by working and thinking in these symbiotic ways and in this, this community-oriented ecological sense, um, we're probably putting more pebbles on that ridge to get the, the ball to go this way. Um, maybe I just, you know, mischaracterize that, but that's how I think of it. Um, I don't think we have any questions yet. If anyone out there wants to throw a question to Jeremy, please do. Um, we don't have much time left. I wanted to ask you one more uh, question, which is about hope. Um, do you have it? <laughs> or maybe that's the wrong question. Um, how do we maintain it? Um, you know, what, you know, the, the, a great deal of what it believe, you know, I feel is a sense of some sense of hope is required in this uh, current context. And there's been a lot of people who have talked about this, Joanna Macy in particular. Um, do you have it? Um, do you have any words mm. of wisdom to impart upon people out there listening that keeps them from turtling into that and spiraling into that place of despair? or just throwing in the towel, pulling out the credit card and going all in on the neoliberal capitalist consumer culture until it all blows up around them. Oh. Yeah, I, I, 
um, I totally hear you. And the answer is I do absolutely have hope. In fact, it's kind of hope that gets me out of bed every morning. Um, but I um, really hasten to add that I don't see hope as being the same as optimism. Right. Um, so uh, a lot of people equate those as being the same. Um, but actually, it's Rebecca Solnit made a really great distinction between that and saying that, you know, really you can, and somebody who's uh, an optimist or a pessimist, either of those two places can lead to a disengagement with the world. If you're an optimist, then you can end up saying, look, it's going to work out well. It always has in the past or, or whatever. Um, I don't need to do anything because th things will be okay. Um, and a pessimist, on the other hand, might say, things are heading to hell in a handbasket, nothing I can do can change it. Both of those places lead to a disengagement with the world. The way that I see hope and the way that I um, feel into that is more as, as I think it was Václav Havel who called it um, basically a state of mind rather than um, a prognostication about the future. It's the state of mind of recognizing that each of us are engaged in co-creating that future. And so it's, um, it's a place of getting engaged in living into the future we want, not because we think it will happen, but because um, it's the right thing to do. And that's what, uh, how Václav Havel talked about it. When we look at, um, at this, uh, the future and where things are going, one of the most important things that arises from that sort of systems understanding of things that you were just touching into is this recognition that we are not separate observers looking at a system that's separate from us. It's not like we're out there in space looking at earth and we're, um, we have nothing to do with it. And we can sort of, or, or like some sort of sports uh, game, we can say, oh, I'm going to put my money on this side or that side. Actually, everything that we do, every conversation we have, every choice we make is part of co-creating that future. And people might say, well, what can I, one person out of seven and a half approaching eight billion people, what can I do that'll make a difference? Nothing I do will make a difference. But to your point about the way of looking at change and, and living systems as being complex with that metaphor of that ball sort of going down a hillside, um, as that the velocity of that ball speeds up, um, you never know. It's, it's, it's um, essentially unpredictable. There's no way, even if you knew every single fact in the universe, you still can predict exactly how that ball is going to interact with things down there. And when that grain of sand, one tiny little thing will cause that tiny little shift, which will lead to a bifurcation that leads that ball to end up in a completely different direction. And when we recognize that ourselves, well, on the one hand, that leads to a sense of actually incredible, profound existential responsibility. Because you go, well, maybe I'm, I might be that grain, that tiny grain. And so I better be really aware that what I do, what I say has a potential implications. It also leads to a sense of empowerment because we realize that even if I'm not that grain of sand myself, I might have an impact on some other thing out there, which is, has an impact on something else, which ultimately does cause that kind of shift. So that recognition of us being part of this complex nonlinear system, to me, that's what hope is about. It's actually this kind of having faith in the potential for um, changes that we can't even, we can barely even imagine right now. And as a result of that, that's the, that's the place where as long as we have life, as long as we have that potential, that's what makes it worth engaging. Well, I think, Jeremy, that that's an excellent um, note to end this talk on, um, that place of hope, our role in facilitating this possible change, our co-creation of a future, that everyone has a part, a great sense, of, a great responsibility, but a great ability to make positive change. Um, I don't think we have any questions from the field. You've answered them all. Um, <laughs> So I'd like to thank you for uh, joining us today. I think we could probably do a few more hours of this. There's lots to dig into. And maybe we will again when the book is out in June. So look, everyone out there, look out for the, the Web of Meaning, publishing in June 2021. Um, so I'd like to thank you, Jeremy, again. Um, please, everyone, uh, 
pop over to Jeremy's website, jeremylent.com. He's going to be posting more content about the book in the coming months there. And you can also learn about his earlier book, which I highly recommend um, everyone reads. Um, pop over to News Society, sign up for our newsletter to hear about um, offers and more about the Web of Meaning in due course. Um, if you're in the UK, have a look at Profile Books um, website. Um, and pop over to literalbcn.com to find out a bit more about the radical December events that remain. Um, lastly, I'd just like to thank Sarah Reeves, my colleague in marketing, for setting this all up. She did a brilliant job. Um, I think we'll end it on that note. Thank you again, Jeremy. Uh, thank you, Rob. Great conversation. Thank you. Great. Have a great day. You too.